it was within the first paragraph, really, of Luke Mogelson's article in The New Yorker. It just sounds simple, but it put its hooks into me, into my heart and into my head, and I couldn't shake it. Read it all the way through twice and just knew before I was done the first time that I had to be a part of this. And not only did I have to write it, but I had to direct it because immediately I saw an opportunity in my own kind of ignorance. It's sort of shameful to admit, but I, until I read this article, I didn't know that the Nineveh SWAT team existed and that they were the only unit that didn't flee ISIS. They were the only unit that stayed and fought in the first three weeks of that fight. I think it was. They lost half their number. I was just enthralled. It was like, you know, reading about heroes and imagining yourself in that same position. God willing, that is never the case. But if I ever found myself in that same position with my family and my home threatened, I would hope that I would act with half the courage that they have. And so when I say an opportunity in my ignorance, I thought there has to be a huge audience like me that doesn't know about these men either, which is something when you consider we've been at war in some way, shape or form with Iraq or in Iraq since I was in high school. Now I'm in my 40s. And frankly, I think we have had our fill of movies where we're pondering that part of the world from an American perspective. I've written a few of those movies. I want to know what the people who have to live there after we leave, I want to know what they do, what they think, how they fight, how they try and protect what's theirs. So all of those things were at the heart of what Luke was writing about in that article. And there was this one piece about one of the youngest members of the team could see his home as they got closer to the city and deeper into the city. At times he could actually, from a vantage point, see his home. And it was in ISIS territory, but he knew that's where his wife and child were. His second wife, because I think his first wife was killed. And that put its hooks into me and I couldn't imagine not doing it. And I couldn't imagine Imagine not doing it in their language with actors from that part of the world who, while they have, maybe they, they didn't live through Mosul, but to be from that part of the world from basically 2001 on is to know danger in kind of a very intimate way and to know what it is to have your life changed and your life threatened. So that's why I wanted to do it. Usually with scripts, you're trying to find it. You're trying to find the story and find the character, and it's a kind of a minute-by-minute minute task. This was different because by the time I finished the article, I knew where the movie should end, if that makes any sense, and I was chasing that. And so it just sort of poured out, which I took as a really good sign, because that was the first time that had really happened in this way, where I just I knew where I had to get, and it was a matter of doing it, not finding it. I'd like to think that they were paramount, that without authenticity and representation, there was no movie. I'll speak for Joe and Anthony and Mike LaRocca and Jeremy Steckler. I don't think any of us were interested in inserting a bankable American movie star on the role of like special forces savior to come teach the team the right way to win the battle. That holds zero interest for me and I think for an audience, a wide audience. I know it didn't hold any interest for Joe and Anthony, and Mike and Jeremy, and the rest of the producers. So to shoot it the way we did, to cast it the way we did, shooting it in air Arabic in that part of the world, as close to that part of the world, the hot zones of that part of the world as we could responsibly get. Shooting it in Baghdad dialect Arabic, the city dialect, because that's more applicable, that's more understandable to the broader audience in that region. And casting it with actors that had only ever played terrorist number one or ISIS driver number four. That was the only way to make this movie. There wasn't a movie without that authenticity and that representation. No one was interested in anything other than that. I was with Joe and Anthony in Atlanta watching them shoot Endgame, I think it was. In between takes, I would just pepper them with questions. And Joe said something, while I'm sure I was annoying the hell out of them, while they're trying to put the finishing touches on a billion dollar franchise, I was just asking advice. And he said something I'd never heard before, and it stuck with me ever since, that directing is blue collar work. I realized he was onto something. 
And he said, so be in good shape because you're gonna be moving a lot and moving things around a lot. So I literally just started, like I was training for a marathon, started running like a madman in the months leading up to us decamping for Marrakesh. And I watched as many movies in this kind of realm as I could. One that had just blew me away, a movie made in the Soviet Union in 1985 called Come and See, which is about the Nazis invading Belarus. It's just astonishing. And I talked with other directors that I've worked with, directors I haven't worked with. I had this great conversation with Jose Padilla about how he goes about filming action. I talked with Jan Demange about what it is to be a first time director. My brother is a director and the only reason I'm in this world in the first place. So I kind of on a nightly basis was on the phone with him and taking him through the script and getting his ideas on books I should read, movies I should watch. I think he told me to watch Thin Red Line again and Stalingrad. Again, Joe and Anthony, at any given moment, I would get on the phone and talk to them about casting, auditioning, and best times of day to shoot. So I never felt alone in this. I guess that's the best answer to how did I prepare myself? I never felt alone. There was never a moment where I didn't feel like after having been in this business at that point for 15 years, I couldn't call somebody. And I didn't really have to go anywhere other than Joe and Anthony. Getting the actors ready for the film was, I was just spectacular because once they realized I wasn't full of shit, that we were actually gonna make a movie in their language about people from the part of the world they hail from or hailed from, and they realized that they weren't just gonna be bad guys, you know, guys that cannon fodder that scream Allahu Akbar, before a bomb detonates. Once they realized that we were serious, they threw themselves into this. There was a three week boot camp that they went through with former special forces commandos in an abandoned hotel outside of Marrakesh that 10 hours a day, they learned how to clear rooms and clear a building and cover each other. And I didn't do that because I wanted them to look slick and smooth on camera. I did it first and foremost, because if they didn't look like they knew what they were doing, nothing else in the movie was gonna work. If that wasn't believable, nothing else was gonna be believable. So that had to be kind of the ticket for entry. And I also wanted them to kind of figure out their own pecking order and develop their own friendships. I mean, nothing builds a bond like extreme times. And this was an extreme time for them. There were injuries. I mean, they're running around this half-built hotel with rebar sticking out of the floor. And it, I think, created a unit before we ever rolled a camera on that unit. The other piece that was really intensive and remained so throughout from pre-production all the way through to rap was the language piece. And everybody spoke Arabic, some dialect, some version of Arabic. And you can imagine when you, know, you have a swath of the world that's 3,500 miles long. Um, there's many variations on that language as there is of the English language. And they constantly worked on that Baghdad dialect. And we had Dr. Abbas, Sam Saleh, Suhail, who's from Iraq. We had Zainab al-Hariri, who was born and raised in Baghdad, at least until she was six or seven years old and then had to flee. Her story is spectacular. Amina Nada, who was my right-hand person, is from Egypt and has a great ear for the accents. So those were the two biggest pieces, the military piece, the building of the skills and the camaraderie and the language. They kind of continued throughout the entirety of the film. Alex Rodriguez, the editor, and I realized pretty early on, you didn't need everything. You didn't need to translate everything. In fact, you understood more with less information on the screen in terms of dialogue and subtitles. Yeah, it was a bit of a revelation, at least for me. And we also realized we could use it to dramatic effect at times when, especially when you have two characters that are together and it's a quieter moment in the movie. Even though you don't know exactly what's being said, you know basically what's being said. You know the emotion. And in fact, it's probably easier to understand that emotion without your eyes you know, moving back and forth. I didn't want to lose the eyes as much as I possibly could. So that was, yeah, like I said, I stumbled into that and I have watched the movie since obviously and realized there's more I could go in there and pull out, but that's just me being greedy, I think.
I would have agreed with you. I did agree with you that it was going to be daunting right up until I got there and realized that if you have 19 languages being spoken on set, which we did, you have a wealth of different perspectives, a wealth of different ways of doing things. You have to just sink your teeth into that. So that was readily apparent. I mean, first day. And the cast, once they realized what we were doing, once they took us seriously, they knew it wasn't some sort of bait and switch, they were up for anything. They would do anything if it made the film better. Any thought I had, idea I had, they would indulge and try because they, again, up until we finished, were still sort of stunned that a Hollywood production was making a movie about this in this way. And I would argue that that buy-in and that enthusiasm, that commitment was so much more of an advantage, orders of magnitude more of an advantage than any sort of detriment. And there's a joke in Morocco, what do you call people who speak two languages, bilingual? What do you call people who speak one, American? I think it was at my expense. So once they saw the tall redheaded guy, they realized he was gonna need a lot of help with the language. And a lot of help was always an arm's length away. Again, on set at any time, I had seven native Iraqi speakers, four of whom spoke in the correct dialect that we needed, correct meaning the Baghdad dialect for the movie. And so I had people who knew this world and this language better than I ever can or will, and they threw themselves into this project for me. So I would take that any day of the week over everybody coming from the same place and speaking the same language. Thanks, take care.